Question 11. A galvanic cell consists of two half cells and can produce electron flow. We know that. Which combination of a standard half cells would produce a uh, 100, sorry, 1.41 volts? Um, that means we need our electrochemical series. So let's have a look at which combinations kind of work for this. So AL and AG, say so AL is way down here, that's sitting at negative uh, 1.66. AG is up here, which is positive 0.84. That's gonna be way more than this um, voltage, so it's not gonna be that one. Zinc and nickel. All right, so nickel and zinc. Zinc is sitting in here, which is um, negative 0.76. Nickel is sitting up here, which is negative 0.25. Again, that's not going to produce enough voltage because there's not a much difference there. Nickel and aluminium. All right, so now we're looking at between 0.25 and 1.66. This is looking pretty good. It's 1.41, so therefore I'm looking at C is going to be our correct answer. Let's just double check. Alum sorry, silver is up here at 0 0.8 and zinc was down here and the difference between these two is 1.56 so it's not going to be that one so therefore it's definitely going to be our answer of C. Question 12. When stored under identical conditions which of the following fatty acids is likely to undergo oxidative rancidity um, in the shortest amount of time? This is to do with the breakdown and basically oxidation. It mainly happens around double bonds. So let's have a look at our, again, handy double clip. And we'll have a look at which ones of these have double bonds. Um, linolenic acid. Uh, let's have a look. This is it here. It's got three double bonds. So therefore, it's got three double bonds. Uh, linoleic acid here has got... Um, two double bonds, so he's got two. Steric acid, I know, only has zero double bonds, and oleic acid here has only got one double bond. So what that means is, for oxidative rancidity, it's going to be A. This guy here, because he has the same, sorry, not the same, the largest number of carbon to carbon double bonds, because that's what oxidative rancidity starts to attack and break down. Moving on. Question 13, from the information above, I'm also looking at this information here, which of the following statements about petrodiesel is correct? So what have we got here? Fuel consumption and CO2 produced. Which one has the highest energy content? Highest energy content is going to be about this one here. And if you're going to use the lowest amount of fuel, you're gonna have the highest amount of energy. So therefore, looking at this, that looks pretty good. Petrodiesel has the lowest fuel consumption, so therefore it must have the highest energy content. Moving on, porous fuel efficiency, that's probably not right because otherwise you would need more of it. Is a renewable energy source, well we know for a fact that that's not right, it's not from the table, but it's just, well, petrodiesel. We know what petrodiesel is. The lowest CO2 emissions when burnt, looking at this, CO2 produced per litre, that is the highest, so it's going to be A, pretty happy with that. And again, crossing all those other options out. Question 14. The use of which vehicle has the smallest impact on the environment in terms of CO2 produced per 100 kilometres um, driven? So we want to look at um, how much CO2 is produced per 100 kilometres. So therefore, this is per litre. So if we go and look at how many litres per kilometre, what we're going to do is times these two together. And we're going to work out which one has the smallest one. So let's have a look at that. Quickly going here, um, 19.7, oops, times 1665 gives me that. So therefore it's 3280.5, uh, 14.5 times 2392 gives me 346. Just do it randomly, 14.2 times 2304 gives me uh, 327 and 9.2 times 2640 gives me 24288. Well, looking at this, I can see that that one here is going to be the lowest. So interestingly, it is uh, petrodiesel 
petrodiesel has the smallest impact on the environment if you're looking at all these things here. Um, yeah, well that's an interesting one there. Um, moving on, we've got question 15. Which of the following statements about denaturation of a protein? Denaturation is the disruption of the tertiary structure is correct. Denaturation, denaturation, sorry, is categorized by the release of peptides. That is not right, because this is um, breaking up of the primary structure, is the release of peptides. Alcohol denatures proteins by disrupting hydrogen bonding. That's interesting. Denaturation involves the disruption of all bonds in the tertiary structure. Every time we see all written in a, um, uh, a multiple choice question, it makes me question it. Um, I don't think it's going to disrupt all bonds, but let's have a look at the next one. The primary and secondary structures are disrupted when denaturation occurs. That is definitely not right, so it only affects the tertiary bonds. Um, so denaturation of a protein, what's going to happen here? Uh, alcohol denatures proteins by disrupting hydrogen bonding. Alcohols have an OH bond. That is going to hydrogen bond with something because that kind of makes sense to me. Uh, I think this all bonds is going to not quite right. It doesn't always, because if you've got a disulfide link, that's covalent. Um, that's not always going to break when you just change a bit of the temperature. Um, so I'm going to say B is our most likely correct answer for that one, because uh, alcohols do produce hydrogen bonds, so therefore if you're going to produce a hydrogen bond, it's going to start to mess up other hydrogen bonds which may actually already exist. So therefore B is going to be our answer, whereas C, although it sounds pretty good, I don't think we're going to um, have those disulfide links um, broken anytime soon because they're covalently bonded um, links in the tertiary structure. And that's it.